In many ways, you could consider Sherlock Holmes to be one of the first superheroes. He was undoubtedly a key inspiration in the creation of Batman's character. Like Batman, Sherlock Holmes doesn't have any powers as such, rather he relies on his genius and his intellect in the pursuit of justice. Also like Batman, Sherlock Holmes' abilities are tantalisingly within reach. So the question is, can you really think like Sherlock Holmes? Sherlock Holmes is actually considered to be the most portrayed character in film and TV, with over 254 incarnations. Over all that media, of course, we've seen Sherlock Holmes do all kinds of things, some of which are quite fanciful, and others of which are quite grounded in reality. This mustn't register on an emotional level. First, distract target. So maybe a good place to start would be to look at John Watson's list of the things that he's observed Sherlock Holmes to be skilled in or adept at. So here is Watson's list of Sherlock Holmes's skills and abilities. Knowledge of literature, nil. Knowledge of philosophy, nil. Knowledge of astronomy, nil. Knowledge of politics, feeble. Knowledge of botany, variable. Well up in belladonna, opium and poisons generally. Knows nothing of practical gardening. Knowledge of geology, practical but limited. Tells at a glance different soils from each other. After walks has shown me splashes upon his trousers and told me by their colour and consistencies in what part of London he had received them. Knowledge of chemistry, profound. Knowledge of anatomy, accurate but unsystematic. Knowledge of sensational literature, immense. He appears to know every detail of every horror portrayed in the century. Plays the violin well, is an expert single stick player, boxer and swordsman. Has a good practical knowledge of British law. So again, like Batman, Sherlock Holmes has got a long list of different skills and abilities, more things than most of us could learn to become that good at in a single lifetime. He does though focus on specific areas that are useful for him and clearly there's a lot of time management going on here. Things like politics just don't interest him, even though I would say that probably could be useful for solving a crime, but that's beside the point. I was admittedly lost for a moment between Charing Cross and Holborn, but I was saved by the bread shop on Saffron Hill. The only baker to use a certain French glaze on their loaves, a Brittany sage. So if we wanted to learn this kind of range and depth of skills, we might look at different accelerated learning techniques. We might use something like the Feynman technique, for instance, or Tim Ferriss's DISC method. I've talked a little about these in previous videos. I'll talk about them more in future, but suffice to say, there are ways to obtain multiple skills more quickly and ways to approach learning. And if you employ these, you certainly can speed up your skill and knowledge acquisition. Likewise, very important is just to focus on learning, keep learning. The more you learn, the more you read, the better you become at absorbing information. Again, I've gone over this on the channel before, but it boils down to brain plasticity. This is the ability of the brain to grow and change shape. And the more we learn, the more we read, the more we produce hormones and neurotransmitters like BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which support the creation of new neural connections. So the more you learn, the better you are at learning. And as you stop experiencing new things, your brain kind of solidifies and eventually starts to atrophy. And that's one of the reasons we start to see our cognitive powers decline as we get older, because we stop learning new things. So keep your brain fresh, keep reading, keep challenging yourself, watch YouTube videos on super speed, listen to Audible whilst you're cooking and washing up, and use accelerated learning techniques if that interests you. But of course, the primary skill that we associate with Sherlock Holmes is his art of deduction. And this is his ability to observe somebody and then know where they've been, know who they are, tell them all sorts of personal intimate details about themselves and freak them out based on the speck of dirt on their collar and the tear at their ankle, which might tell him that they have a dog and that they've been mud wrestling recently. How about them? The sentimental widow and her son, the unemployed fisherman. The answer is yes. Yes. She's got a West Highland Terrier called Whiskey. Not exactly what we're looking for. Sure, for God's sake. So deduction of real skill, isn't it something that you can go about developing yourself? Well, the art or the science of deduction, as it's referred to in the books, is something that was made up by Arthur Conan Doyle. It's not real science, but that doesn't mean we can't learn it. It doesn't mean that it's not grounded in some more realistic principles. So the first clue to successfully deducing information from uh, limited data is to deduce. So the clue is in the name, deduction, subtraction. Rather than going into a situation with a hypothesis, with a conclusion preformed, try to remove all of your preconceptions and prejudices and instead just observe the situation for what it is. In the book Mastermind, 
how to think like Sherlock Holmes. The author talks a lot about cognitive biases and fallacies and how these can upset our conclusions and cause us to jump to the wrong ones. You need to make sure that you're looking for causation, not correlation, not making assumptions. And then eliminate what isn't the answer and you should be left with what is. As Sherlock Holmes says, once you eliminate the impossible, what you're left with, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. So that was paraphrasing. But the point is that you're removing every wrong option in order to be left eventually with the right option. Now, of course, what's more important is that you're able to observe. And if you're really going to be able to spot that person on the street who has a bit of flour on him that tells you he's a baker, you're going to need to keep your eyes and ears open. So again, this is something I've talked about in previous videos on this channel. This is such a big topic that I'm going for breadth rather than depth. And if you're interested in learning more about any of these things, then I'll have links to my other videos and articles down below. So being more observant, this comes down to mindfulness and meditation because so many of us are in our own heads. We're constantly in our default mode networks. We're daydreaming. We're thinking about all sorts of things, worrying about work, being distracted by billboards and by our phones buzzing in our pockets, but not just looking around and being open to the new information that's available to us. So practice mindfulness by just taking the time to engage with the world around you. Next time you go for a walk, take the time to look around. Try and be out of your own mind and instead feel the wind on your skin, hear the noises and look for things in the environment. One game I like to play to try and increase my observational skills is just to set myself some kind of challenge, like I might look for everyone wearing a tie. And that just keeps my eyes open and prevents me from being inside my own head. It's a good way of getting into that positive habit. But any form of mindfulness training or meditation will over time improve your ability to change your focus from internal to external and to be more aware of your senses and your surroundings. I also talked in a previous video about splatter vision. Splatter vision means engaging your peripheral vision. And when you engage your peripheral vision, you allow yourself to absorb more information through your senses. And whilst you lose some detail, you increase the breadth. Again, breadth over depth. That's like a theme of this video. So to engage your splatter vision or your owl eyes, as it's also referred to, you put your arms out like this, wiggle your fingers, and then observe your fingers with the sides of your eyes, with your peripheral vision. And then keep looking forwards, but just keep your vision wider like this. Like I say, you'll lose some of the detail, some of the focus that you get from focusing on one point, but you're now taking in more information. And this is something that survivalists will use when they're walking through the wild. And it's also something that FBI agents are trained when observing crowds for suspicious behavior. Splatter vision and mindfulness are just two ways to increase your situational awareness. Situational awareness simply means being more aware of your surroundings and what's going on. And this is, once again, something that is trained in FBI agents and MI5, but it's also generally useful and could help you to um, survive best if there's some kind of crisis to react quickly to a problem. One way you can improve your situational awareness is to establish a baseline. That means establishing the mood of the room or the area and working out what normal behaviour in that situation is. And once you've established this baseline, then you can look for people who are acting unusually, anomalies, and they will stand out to you more. Likewise, you also need to make sure that you have a good view of your surroundings. That might just mean situating yourself in the corner of the room so your back's to the wall, no one can sneak up behind you and you can get a good overall view of your surroundings. Look out for key sites such as exits or potential weapons or people that look like they might start trouble. You can find an excellent article on situational awareness over at The Art of Manliness. I'll leave a link to that in the description down below. I recommend you check it out. I come in here and the first thing I'm doing is I'm catching the sight lines and looking for an exit. I see the exit sign too. I'm not worried. I can tell you the license plate numbers of all six cars outside. If you can do all this, if you can be more mindful, if you can use your splatter vision, if you can practice techniques and read about situational awareness, then all of this will help you to increase your observational skills so that you can start to make more deductions. One last thing that might be useful for you to learn as well is body language. And body language is a very interesting topic and something I might cover more on this channel in future, but basically it means looking at different aspects of the way someone's standing or the way they're moving and even what they're wearing, etc., and how they're positioning themselves in relation to other people and then 
estimating how they must be feeling, what they're thinking and what they're planning. And that's another aspect, of course, that's very useful if you're gonna learn more about a person or a situation. But that's, of course, only one part of making a deduction because that gives you the information, you're absorbing more information from the world around you, but the deduction itself means finding patterns and connections from that information and from your environment. So how can you make more of these connections? Well, again, I've talked about this in previous videos, but it comes down to increasing your creativity. So how can we be more creative and get better at problem solving so that we can provide more novel hypotheses and conclusions? Well, often this comes down to relaxing and allowing our brain to explore the myriad ideas. When we're very focused or very stressed, we tend to focus on just one idea or one subject. We might be worried about work. We might be distracted by that shifty looking guy in the corner. But when we relax and when we allow our brain to explore different ideas, this is when we can come up with novel connections because we're looking at different parts of our brain at once. We might be daydreaming whilst also kind of looking over there. And then we might think, hang on, those two things are related. So we're looking at the bank of information and the stimulus in front of us and we're combining those things in order to come up with a novel idea. So you need to be more relaxed and you need to train yourself to stay relaxed in a high tense situation. At the same time, you can also check out my video on functional fixedness and how you can use different techniques in order to overcome the tendency to view things in a very set and confined way. And of course, in the books and many of the TV shows and films, Sherlock Holmes will also experiment with drugs in order to increase his creativity. Now, of course, I'm not gonna recommend that you start doing some kind of hard class A drugs in order to think more like Sherlock Holmes. That's more likely to make you think like a vegetable. So what I would recommend instead is just to take time out, meditate, much healthier, much safer way to increase your relaxation and to explore different ideas. And maybe consider experimenting a little with nootropics. You could try L-theanine, this relaxes the brain. And like I say, that's up to you. Again, I've got content on the site about that if that's something that interests you. So now we're more observant and also more creative. The next step is to try and increase the amount of information available to us because as we've seen, Sherlock Holmes has got a lot of information about a lot of different topics. Like I said, you can use um, accelerated learning techniques to increase your knowledge in different fields. But at the same time, he seems to have an incredible memory. And this is something that's often played up in the shows and on TV and in the books. So how can you increase your ability to store potentially useful information and then use that to make assumptions about the world going forwards? Well, now we're getting into the realm of memory master techniques. And that's something I haven't touched on on this site much, but I definitely will be in future. So if you wanna see more about memory master techniques then subscribe, but generally, Increasing your ability to remember something ultimately comes down to making it more memorable. That sounds obvious, but it often eludes us. So when you try and remember a number, the problem with remembering a number or the name of some researcher that you've got to remember for your course, the problem with that is that it's just very dull. It has no personal meaning to you. It has no context. It's just this dull random word or number. And to your brain, to your primal brain, there's nothing particularly interesting about that. There's no reason to store that information. So how might we make this more interesting? Well, one option is to use mnemonics. And that simply means that you're using a rhyme or some kind of memorable phrase, or you're linking that idea to another idea in your brain or creating an image around that idea. And by doing this, you're just linking something boring to something much more interesting that works for your brain and the way that you store information. But there's way more interesting and advanced techniques you can use as well. One of the best resources for this is Darren Brown's Trick of the Mind. Now on biohacking and uh, brain training videos like this, I rarely hear Darren Brown mentioned, but that's a shame because Darren Brown is awesome. If anyone is a real life Sherlock Holmes, it's probably Darren Brown. And I'm lucky enough to have briefly met him in real life. And he's also a really sound guy. So yeah, he's a legend. And again, I might do more on Darren Brown in future. Yeah, yeah. All right, look at me. Look at me. First thing is you walk towards me, your posture is strong and solid. This is obviously a physical and control thing that you're involved in. Your handshake was solid. There's a kind of a thing, you're kind of checking yeah. me out slightly, almost <laughs> not suspicious, but you're checking me out. So I'm guessing you're in some kind of security job, is that right? <laughs> Regulation haircut, so you're not a bouncer. So this is maybe something to do with uh, police or something like that. So in the book, Trick of the Mind, Darren Brown talks about many of the techniques he uses. That includes things like misdirection, but also, of course, memory master techniques. And he goes over a lot of more interesting and more advanced techniques, such as the linking method, and here, you've got a long list of objects you need to remember, and you associate each one with a ridiculous or particularly memorable image, and then you link that image to the next item on the list, the image that you associate with that item. So by linking them, you create a sequence and you can regurgitate that list in the exact order for ages. 
I went through the exercise in the book and I can remember this list of objects for months and months afterwards. It's very effective. He also talks about the loci method associated with the ancient Greek art of memory. And this basically means that you're associating images with items you need to remember, usually on a route that you know well, like your route home. So you might picture item one to be on the corner of the road. You might picture item two to be at that tree that you pass on the way home. And by doing this, you can visualize going through that walk and thereby see each of the items on your list using your mind's eye. And of course, the next step from that is to use a memory palace. And this is what we see a lot in the show, Sherlock. Memory technique is sort of mental map. You plot a, a map with a location. It doesn't have to be a real place. And then you deposit memories there. Theoretically, you can never forget anything. This is basically either a real place or an imagined place that you visualize in your mind's eye and you position things you want to remember around to that palace. And by linking these dull or difficult, obtuse facts and figures to things you know well in your environment or your imagined environment, you can thereby explore them in your mind's eye and remember these things much more effectively. The Memory Palace technique is a fascinating one and again something I'll be talking about more on this channel in future. And one last one that Darren Brown goes over is the PEG system. This is more for numbers and of course numbers are difficult to remember because they're very dull, very bland. So instead of remembering one, two, three, you might remember bun, Lou, C, and then picture those things. And picturing those things, combining those items into interesting scenes in your mind's eye can help you to remember what's otherwise a dull number. So basically what you're doing with all of these techniques is taking something dull or obtuse or arbitrary and then linking it with something that's more memorable, more emotive in your mind's eye in order to retrieve it more easily in future. So it boils down to association and another interesting example of using association to remember things better is synesthesia. So synesthesia is a phenomenon affecting some people, usually by birth, and it basically means that they associate one sense with activation in another. So if you were to see numbers, you might find that you experience them in different colors, or if you were to listen to music, you might find that you notice different colors floating around you, or you might find that when you see certain letters, you imagine them to have some kind of personality. This is synesthesia because you've got crosstalk between the different perceptions in the brain. But it can take a range of different forms, and in some cases it can actually be quite beneficial, like a superpower, for the individual. So in one case, Daniel Tammet, who is a famous mathematician, is able to visualize numbers as objects, as quantities. And by doing this, he was able to recite pi and break the European record. I kept a list of words according to their shape and texture. Words round as a three, gobble, cupboard, cabbage. Another example that I read about recently was someone who observed scary scenes when they were feeling scared. So if they were feeling uncomfortable or anxious about something, then they would witness a kind of scenic view of hills and mountains that set them slightly on edge. And this turned out to be useful for them because they once were approaching a snake and apparently they weren't consciously aware of the snake, but obviously they were unconsciously aware of it. This flashed up this view of mountains looking scary and actually alerted them to the presence of the snake before they became consciously aware of it. So they stopped walking, or I think they were on a bike, they stopped their bike and they didn't hit the snake and they averted danger. This is almost like a spider sense that's created through synesthesia. Some other people see grids in their vision when they're using synesthesia. So it has real application and a lot of people say it helps their memory. And that's why I hypothesize that were Sherlock Holmes real, then he might actually have some kind of form of synesthesia. The term synesthesia itself might actually be somewhat inaccurate. More recently, it's being referred to as ideasthesia, seeing as it's not so much to do with your senses as it is to do with concepts. So if you were paying attention when I said that seeing numbers or letters could make you feel a certain way, well, seeing letters and numbers isn't vision, vision is vision. Seeing letters and numbers is more to do with the semantics, the meaning of what you're seeing. And this is what causes you to experience the numbers or the colors. Likewise, with music, it's the fact that it's music, not that it's sound, that makes you see those things. And numbers and seeing mathematical grids is another example of this. So it might be more to do with ideas rather than senses. It's also useful to note there are two different types of synesthesia or ideasthesia. These are projective and associative. So projective is when you actually literally see the color or the environment or the grid, 
whereas associative is where you just kind of feel or know that association. What's really interesting is that you might be able to develop associative synesthesia through training. Several studies have found this now. They generally involve getting someone to read a book and that book will have a certain letter and a certain colour. Eventually that letter is missing and you just see the colour and then this replaces lots of letters and eventually just seeing the colours is enough to help you read. And there are other examples of how you can train synesthesia in this way. I'm really interested in the use of an abacus. So an abacus, of course, is the thing you use to do maths when you're younger. You slide the pegs along the rails and eventually this can actually improve your maths because you can visualise that abacus and use it to perform sums. And there are different tools like this that allow you to do more complex mathematics and this is a very good way to perform nearly as well as a calculator without the calculator. And this is very similar to what we saw in Daniel Tammet or someone who visualises a grid when they do maths because you're using a different sense to help you tackle a different subject and you're doing that through association, trained association. Synesthesia actually seems to occur in all of us to some extent. It's a large part of how language develops, so it makes sense that you should be able to develop this. And it might also be that by increasing certain neurotransmitters you can develop synesthesia. Occasionally an injury can bring on synesthesia and this seems to be because it causes a sudden release of huge amounts of neurotransmitters and using certain drugs has also been shown to bring on synesthesia-like experiences. So maybe nootropics could have a role here as well or just trying to increase your brain plasticity in order to make your brain more malleable so that not only will you be able to retain more information but you might also be able to develop more learning techniques and even train synesthesia. Finally, Sherlock Holmes also has a very impressive working memory. This is the memory that we use to hold on to ideas whilst we manipulate them. So if you're doing a sum, working memory is what you use in order to carry numbers over in your mind's eye. Working memory, it seems, is actually synonymous with visualisation. It is the ability to visualise a number or a sound or an object or a room so that you can work on that idea without actually having to have it written down in front of you. So visualisation and training visualisation will improve your working memory. So too will brain training games like the dual end back test and likewise so will chess and of course chess is something that we often see Sherlock Holmes playing in the various films and TV series. I did a video on working memory so if you want to learn more about that then that's another one to check out. It will be linked in the description down below also. And improving your working memory like this can also help you to perform that awesome feat that Sherlock Holmes performs at the end of the second Robert Downey Jr film where he plays that game of chess against Moriarty just by words because he's able to visualize the entire chessboard and where all the pieces are at the same time. Bishop to bishop seven. Queen takes night pawn. Does the art of domestic horticulture mean anything to you? And this is also how he's able to do that kind of Sherlock Holmes vision fighting where he predicts the outcome of the fight if he does this or that. This would be based again on working memory, the ability to store information and visualize it, but also on his theory of mind, his ability to predict how others will behave, which you can get and develop through observation, which we've said is very important. I would also recommend just spending time people watching. That's a great skill for developing your uh, body language skills and your general observ observation. And by training that internal physics engine, which I've talked about in previous videos on visualization training. So that's a whole lot of coverage just there. Like I say, breadth, not depth. But basically, you can improve your ability to think like Sherlock Holmes by learning more, using accelerated learning techniques, by improving your memory, by using memory master techniques, by training your visualization and your working memory, by reading as much as possible, by observing people, by people watching, by learning about body language and all those things and improving your nutrition and your exercise and your sleep to make your brain as plastic as possible and keep it growing. So can you think like Sherlock Holmes? Probably not exactly like the character in the books, but certainly you can think a little bit more like him with the right training and with the right impetus. So I hope you found this video useful and interesting guys. If you did, then please consider leaving a like. Please share it around, that helps me so much. Check out my social media channels down below. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. That's where I post my workouts and my training and my um, working online. And if you're interested in this topic and others like it, then please subscribe to the channel. I've got much more coming on brain training, bodybuilding, uh, fitness, running, parkour, working online, nootropics, nutrition, you name it. So if that sounds good, then thanks a ton for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.
I'm such a knob. <laughs>